Pressure from the West pushes China and Russia closer together. Xi Jinping meets Vladimir Putin on his first foreign trip since the pandemic began. What message are these presidents trying to send and can they reshape the international political and economic order? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Imran Khan. China's president is making his first foreign trip since the pandemic began more than two years ago. Xi Jinping's first stop was Kazakhstan. That's where he launched his signature Belt and Road Initiative in 2013 to help build major infrastructure projects, especially in developing economies. Xi and Kazakhstan's president signed a statement pledging mutual support for their country's sovereignty, security and territorial integrity. She then flew to Uzbekistan for a meeting of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Moscow and Beijing formed the Eurasian Regional Bloc in 2001, partly to counter U.S. influence. She met with President Vladimir Putin uh, for the first time since Russia invaded Ukraine. Both nations are looking for support in the face of sanctions and isolation from the West. Rasul Sardar has more from the Uzbek city of Samarkand. The leaders of the East are gathering in the ancient city of Samarkand in Uzbekistan at Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Several bilateral meetings are taking place here, but perhaps the most important one is the meeting between the Russian President Vladimir Putin and Chinese leader Xi Jinping. The Ukrainian crisis and energy are on the top of the agenda. Russia wants a solid support from China regarding its war in Ukraine. China says that the war in Ukraine was provoked by NATO. However, it refrains from explicitly saying that the war war in Ukraine is well justified and legitimate one. This is something that Russia definitely wants to hear. And in return, China is asking more support from Russia regarding Taiwan. Secondly, Russia wants to sell more oil and gas to China. It's crucially important for Russia regarding the fact that it is under the heavy sanctions imposed by the Western, uh, Western countries. And it wants to, uh, to find out more resources for revenues to protect its economy from a collapse. Despite China being the number one client for the Russian energy, it also wants to have more alternatives. So the, the, the Chinese leader, Xi uh, Jinping, was in Kazakhstan right ahead of the, uh, the, the Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization Summit in Uzbekistan to seek for uh, increasing, uh, the, increasing the, the, the gas import from Kazakhstan. And the experts say that the reason for that, one of the reasons for that is that China doesn't want its relations with Russia to come at the expense of, at the cost of its relations with the West. Rasul Serdar for Inside Story. Now, as Rasul mentioned, China has avoided openly supporting Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But in the past week, Beijing's third highest ranking leader made his strongest statements yet. The lower house of Russia's parliament released this video of Li Jianxu's meeting in Moscow. On Russia's core interests and major issues of concern, China expresses its understanding and full support for Russia. On the Ukraine issue, for example, the US and NATO are expanding directly on Russia's doorstep, threatening Russia's national security and the lives of Russian citizens. Given the circumstances, Russia has taken necessary measures. China understands, and we are coordinating on various aspects. I believe Russia was cornered. In this case, to protect the country's core interests, Russia gave a resolute response. Let's take a look at Russia and China's relationship. In February, they declared a no-limits partnership, and China has criticised sanctions imposed over the war in Ukraine while expanding trade. It was also Russia's second largest arms buyer. But in March, US officials reported that Moscow had requested Beijing's military assistance in the conflict. Now, the European Union punished Russia by removing it from the international money transfer system SWIFT, China is reported to have offered assistance with its own system. And in June, President Xi hosted the BRICS summit for the developing economies of Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. And then in 2015, they launched the New Development Bank that poured almost $32 billion into projects. Let's bring our guests in Beijing, Aina Tangen, 
Senior Fellow at the Tahi Institute in Moscow, Dmitry Babich, Political Analyst at the Enosme Internet Project based in Moscow, and in Brussels, Theresa Fallon, Director of the Center for Russia, Europe, Asia Studies. Welcome to the program. Let me begin in Beijing uh, first. Is this a hard power play by China, or is it a soft power play? And by that, I mean, is China going to start using its financial, political muscle uh, to formulate this new uh, partnership with Russia that's going to try and reshape the world? Well, I don't think it's necessary a new partnership with Russia. Uh, this is the uh, SCO. I mean, there's a whole bunch of nations there and a lot more waiting on the doorstep to join. Uh, what China is trying to do, as is, is, you know, you, in your opening, you pointed out, they are making sure that they're spreading their business around in terms of gas, and they made a very, very, uh, you know, pointed statement in Kazakhstan where they said territorial uh, integrity is very important. The reason this is uh, apropos to mention is that there have been uh, rumblings of very, from very hawkish conservative uh, uh, people in Russia saying that, uh, you know. Kazakhstan was not supportive enough of Russia's actions uh, in Ukraine, and also that there are lands that should rightfully be in Russia's hands. So uh, the fact that uh, she went there first is a good indication that uh, China is playing this very, very carefully. They do not want to make enemies. What they want is a new, a new regional world order. Uh, I'm sorry, not world, a new regional order that allows them to have dialogue instead of uh, you know, this kind of uh, dis dissatisfied and you know, warlike uh, atmosphere. But by bringing in Russia at this point in order to have that regional world order, you know, regional order rather, um, as you say, Russia right now is under a tremendous amount of pressure. If China truly does back Russia, it exposes itself, doesn't it, Aina? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you know, there, there's these different narratives that are out there and a kind of false dichotomy that if somehow if you deal with Russia, you are, you know, you're the equivalent of a baby killer, you favor, uh, you know, war in Ukraine and things like that. That's not the case. And the global south has made that very, very clear. It's not just China, it's India, it's um, countries in South America. In um, Africa, we, we all witnessed the, uh, uh, the speech of the um, <clears throat> of the uh, foreign minister of South Africa, who she dr uh, dressed down Blinken while he sat in front of her about, uh, you know, uh, the U.S. trying to demand that people take sides in a conflict that they don't see as theirs. So this issue about, um, you know, Ukraine and Russia is very simple from China's point of view. They see this as the Americans uh, provoking a situation in which there was a response. They do not agree uh, with uh, this idea that nations should be taking uh, matters like this into their own hands, but they understand that there are security concerns. Now, in terms of uh, China in particular, they have the same kind of concerns with Taiwan. They see the same type of action by the U.S. Uh, towards Taiwan, uh, these upgrading of, of uh, relations, trying to make it a quasi-country, making it a, a NATO partner, uh, all of these things, uh, selling it uh, billions of dollars worth of arms, these are provocative by China's standards and a violation of the three communiques. So you're going to see Russia and China being pushed together by what they perceive as U.S. aggression uh, towards them. Uh, Dimitri, in Moscow, uh, clearly Moscow is going to welcome any kind of support for uh, Russia in this at this particular time. But is the cost of this slightly too high? I mean, Russia is used, to, is used to being the main power. I mean, here it feels like Russia might be the junior partner compared to China. Uh, well, uh, no, there are no such fears in Russia because compared to what we have from the European Union and from the United States, uh, and that is just uh, total hostility, uh, being a junior partner to China doesn't look like such a terrible perspective. Uh, and I agree with the previous speaker from Beijing uh, that basically uh, Russia and China both feel threatened uh, by the modern West. Uh, by its ideology, which views any countries and any personalities that don't fit uh, the ultra-liberal narrative now dominant in the West, uh, any countries and any personalities like that are seen as enemies uh, by the West, and, and they are declared enemies openly. I mean, if you compare uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, if you compare a Collective Security Treaty Organization headed by Russia, if you compare them to NATO and the EU, NATO and the EU for years 
have been sounding much more belligerently. I mean, CSTO, uh, usually the uh, sessions begin with a statement that this organization is not directed against any third countries, any other countries. With NATO, you always have it. Russia is a threat. China is changing the world order. So China is also kind of a threat. Uh, and this is the kind of rhetoric that has been uh, not irritating, but, uh, you know, just making very angry uh, both the people in China and the people in Russia. So in that case, uh, President Xi and President Putin, they have support of their nations. There are many people in Russia and in China who are angry about the actions of the modern West. And, and as for your previous question, when you said, uh, is it a good time for China to bring Russia on? <laughs> well, uh, is, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, unlike NATO, mm. is a, a, a nation of equals. You cannot exclude mm. anyone from that organization arbitrarily. If right. a country is a member, it will be there. You don't have to get a special invitation. And what makes this summit special uh, is the inclusion of Iran, which for many years had been viewed with a kind of suspicion by Russia and China. Uh, you remember probably that President Medvedev, our former president... Dimitri, sorry, sorry, we, we will have plenty of time to talk about all of this, but I do want to bring in Theresa Fallon. Uh, Theresa, it seems to me that this is now China's world and we simply live in it and there's nothing we can do about it. Is that true? Well, as the Chinese like to say, it's a win-win uh, situation with Russia, because if Russia loses in Ukraine, Russia, China actually gets a weakened Russia, which is much to their benefit. And should they win in Ukraine, which doesn't look likely these days, uh, that, you know, they, they've been kind of at least rhetorically supporting them. And they've been spreading their propaganda message in the global south. So I, I think that. Uh, it's very difficult for many analysts to accept here in Europe that Russia and China are so closely uh, having a strategic convergence. And I think that this makes them extremely uncomfortable because this is also true in Central Asia. As we saw with uh, Xi Jinping's comments yesterday in Kazakhstan, stating what was mentioned in the run-up to this program about how th that uh, China will not allow Russia, he didn't use the word Russia, but any impingement on Kazakhstan sovereignty. And I think this is a key message because since Beijing has sided with Russia in regard to Ukraine, he has alienated to a certain level Central Asian states, which were part of the Soviet Union, who are watching what happens in Ukraine, and they are terrified that Putin should do the same thing with them. So these countries have been balancing between Russia and China for many, many uh, decades. And so I think that uh, she, with the run-up, all international politics for she is domestic right now, especially with the October meeting coming up. So he wants to look strong, powerful, take advantage. This is the worst possible time for Putin with Ukraine's huge uh, uh, you know, pushback on Russia. And so the optics are awful for Putin. So I think this is a smart move by Xi Jinping. He looks very uh, like an international leader. There's not a lot of places he can go these days. This is his first trip outside of China since COVID. And then he has this kind of feather in his cap. He had a meeting in Ukraine, signed 20 uh, MOUs with the leader there, and now the SEO. So the SEO uh, it talks about... Uh, cooperation, but there is a lot of fragmentation, a lot of internal problems. We see uh, strains between India and China, mm -hmm. India and Pakistan. These are all members of the SEO. So they talk about cooperation, but there's a lot going on. There's a lot of moving parts to this. Uh, let's get back to Beijing. There's a lot of uh, moving parts, as our guest has said, in Brussels. But one of the key things about China's role when it comes to other countries is always respected whoever's in charge. Let's take the example of Pakistan. For example, China has long been a very good friend to Pakistan. It hasn't said you need to be a democracy or there shouldn't be a military dictator. It simply dealt with whatever government, whatever military was in power. On the other hand, Pakistanis long complained that the Americans are uh, interfering in their domestic affairs by having this insistence on freedom and democracy. Is that something that China is now going to lean into? Will it keep that up? Will it keep uh, dealing with the people in power without actually insisting on any kind of political change? Well, you know, I, I actually kind of object to the form of your question in this in sense that uh, the Pakistanis, you say, are complaining about freedom and liberty. I don't think that's really it. It's about a sovereign nation. Uh, let, let's look carefully at the difference between the U.S. and China when it calls a summit. 
uh, with uh, SEO. It's about internal matters. It's about uh, you know getting rid of uh, terrorism, cross border terrorism, financing of terrorism, et cetera, uh, trying to make sure that there's a moderate things. The idea is that they want to settle the neighborhood. Now, there's a lot of contentious relations, as the previous speaker uh, talked about, but they didn't exclude anybody. Uh, let's go to the um, summit of the Americas, where Biden invited only those uh, countries that he thought he wanted to talk to and excluded a bunch of others. That, of course, had an immediate backlash. You know, the world is as it is, and you can have dialogue or you can create walls or try to contain countries, change their, uh, you know, their governments through regime change uh, opportunities and things like this. This is standard practice for the U.S. You know, the question you should be asking is, does the world want the U.S. to be the policeman of it? And uh, if it is going to be the policeman, shouldn't it lead by example as opposed to uh, hypocrisy? Well, it's lucky we're on a talk show. We can ask that question to both our other guests. Uh, let's speak to uh, Dmitry in Moscow. Uh, the U.S. role, is it over? Is it dishonest? Is, is, are we talking about the fall, uh, the, the fall of the influence of the U.S. now? Well, definitely. And uh, I can tell you, as a person who, as a young journalist, lived in the Soviet Union and I saw the first post-Soviet years, a lot of people in uh, the former Soviet Union, including myself, uh, we were not against uh, the United States as a benign policeman because the image of Americans and the British was very positive at the time. And uh, as nations, we still view them very positively. What we don't view positively is the new ideology which got entrenched in the United States and in uh, uh, the European Union uh, in the last, uh, I would say, a few dozens of years and which led to terrible conflicts. Uh, our previous speaker in Beijing rightly mentioned the regime change. I mean, Theresa says that Central Asian countries are seen with uh, terror what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, well, I can tell you for sure, I was there in 2014. They looked in terror at what Victoria Nuland did in Ukraine, in Kiev in 2014. The Kazakh president at the time, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, made a special statement that some people in Kazakhstan may want to oust the legally elected government the same way they did it in Ukraine. We're not going to allow them to do it. So we better look at this situation in perspective. The countries in Central Asia, they may not be mm. happy with the Chinese attitude to economy. They may not be happy with Russia's actions in Ukraine. But somehow Russia and China respect their political systems by not trying to lecture them on how they should build their democracies. Right. And uh, let, me, let me say a very heretical thought here. Uh, uh, in the West right now, especially in the United States, they keep talking about autocracies against democracies. And of course, they are democracies, we are autocracies. But uh, read any... Uh, textbook on politology, and you will find out uh, any textbook on political science, there is something worse than autocracy, that is totalitarianism. Mm. And I lived in a totalitarian state. I remember that there was only one view for every event, for every situation in the world. That's exactly what we have now in the United States and in the EU about the situation in Ukraine. Only one view is allowed. There is no discussion, or almost right. no discussion. Okay. And in reality, the situation there is complicated. In Russia, you can criticize the so-called military operation, which we have been calling a war. Dimitri, I'm really, sorry to, I'm really sorry it's to cut you off. I'm really sorry to cut you off. I think you made your point brilliantly. Uh, I want to bring in uh, Theresa Fallon in Brussels. You had a bemused look on your face there as Dimitri was speaking. Where is the US in all of this? I just want to pick up on one earlier point, because the more people say it, it doesn't make it true. Uh, the fact that Sweden and Finland, for example, want to join NATO, President Putin said there was no problem with them joining. So this And Finland shares a huge border with Russia. So this narrative that it's this war in Ukraine was because of NATO expansion has been proven false, even by President Putin himself. Second, uh, the problem on Maidan, the, the protest, happened after the, uh, the leader refused to sign the agreement with the EU because the public wanted closer economic cooperation within the EU. So that was the reason for the beginning of the, the protests and the, the kind of unraveling. And Putin felt he really had to make a move. So I would add, um, you know, there's this kind of uh, 
division of labor in the past in Central Asia. Russia was the rifle, China was the purse. But China's economy is slowing down. Russia's really going to be in very difficult straits for the next decades. They've had a huge brain drain because of the war in Ukraine, plus all these economic sanctions. So the outcome is remains to be seen what happens in Central Asia. But Putin has very strong feelings, especially about Kazakhstan, because it shares such a long border with them. We shouldn't underestimate the agency of these countries, especially right. Kazakhstan. I mean, they, uh, their economy is growing and they have large energy exports. And um, I'm sorry, you wanted to say... Yeah, so I'm on. just going to bring in Einar here. Uh, you were shaking your head there as Theresa was speaking. Do you want to react to any of that? Yeah, yes. I mean, I, 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 Teresa, I'm sure you're, these are wonderful talk points and they represent a point of view. But let's be realistic. What do you say about Afghanistan, Iraq, all the uh, you know turmoil that's been created by the United States and its efforts for first for revenge, then for uh, nation building and then walking away from it? I mean, the Middle East is broken because of the U.S. Uh, there are similar things that happened in Africa and also South America. So t tell me again how it is that China and Russia are the ones who are destabilizing the world. I mean, terrorism has been a many-headed hydra. Every time the U.S. says that it has chopped off one, two appear. So tell me again why, why you know, how it is that the United States has been helping and is, is the, you know, on the side of the angels and everyone else is on the side of the evil. And I want to bring in Dimitri here. Dimitri, you're hearing two very different perspectives there from the Chinese and from uh, the, well, from Theresa Fallon, not, not, not to speak on behalf of the Americans, certainly. But, you're, I mean, at some point, Russia is going to have to decide who it wants to throw its lot in. China is not completely backing Russia when it comes to the war in Ukraine. Not publicly. They're afraid of sanctions as well. America still has some real power over Russia here, doesn't it? Of course, the war in Ukraine is a tragedy. Uh, but uh, certainly the Western view, uh, the view represented by Theresa, is a simplistic view of that tragedy. You know, Theresa said that it started when Yanukovych postponed, he did not refuse, he postponed the signing of association agreement with the EU and the public wanted it. Well, Yanukovych, as the president, had the full right to postpone the signing of that agreement. The violent action against him, during which 38 policemen were killed, was absolutely illegal. Uh, you know, you can imagine what would happen in the United States to someone who killed 38 policemen trying to make the president sign some kind of a document. Uh, and, uh, and this action, unfortunately, was fully supported by the United States and by the EU. That was a disgrace. This was the first step towards this civil war, actually civil war, that we are seeing now in Ukraine, because these are people speaking the same language right. in most of the cases, okay. who watch the same movies, went to the same schools. But Sadly, I will just finish very quickly. I support, I support our previous speaker from Beijing. Uh, I criticized a lot of actions of President Putin and a lot of things that Russia and China may be doing on the international stage. But everything is seen in comparison. The United States and the EU have no right to lecture Russia and China after everything they have done in Syria. Sorry, Dimitri, in Libya, we, have, we are running out of time, and I do yes. want to come very quickly to Theresa. Uh, Theresa, I want you to answer this question: uh, What can the US do when this is happening? I think the two giants of Russia and China they will actually eventually pull apart. So I think the US should just kind of sit back and, and watch the show. Uh, I think that this idea of a rules-based order, I mean, it, it sounds like Russia and China have such great plans. I mean, an unprovoked war in Ukraine, uh, what's happening in Xinjiang, this is another key issue that Xi Jinping needs to get some sort of uh, agreement from Tokayev not to talk about the Xinjiang Yuan uh, uh, report, because this is kind of alienating Muslims in Central Asia. And so if the leadership tries to downplay this, uh, that's a key issue because Xinjiang is also the gateway on the Belt and Road Initiative. So this is also a point of friction. So it's a difficult diplomatic balancing act that Xi Jinping has to do. He has to try to stop Tokayev because that, if he blocks uh, his initiatives, the whole Belt and Road is dead. And I would say that right. we're seeing a bifurcation in the world mm. order between West and Asia Pacific Four, including Australia, New Zealand, uh, Japan, and South Korea, and the rest Iran, uh, India, Russia, China, uh, and 
Um, India is kind of this independent country trying to make the most out of all, you know, benefit from all sides. So I think that the rules-based order versus this kind of uh, growing group of uh, axis uh, will be interesting to watch. That's why I think this SEO meeting is watched more than any other SEO meeting in my memory. So it has galvanized the world's attention, okay. and we're going to see how Russia, China, how, how they play this out. A very spirited debate there. Uh, I want to thank all our guests, Aina Tangen, Dimitri Babich and uh, Teresa Fallon. And I want to thank you as well for watching. Now, you can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. We are at AJ Inside Story from me, Imran Khan, and the whole team here. Bye for now.